Okay, lecture number nine. Today we will cover memory technologies. Um, you might think we have already talked about memories, right? Like when we had the external bus interface. There we were really looking at bus interfaces. This time we will actually looking at memory technology. So what's inside of these memories and how do they work internally? All right. I actually noticed last time that I forgot a whole part of the lecture. Um, and I already did part that I was supposed to do in this lecture. So let me backtrack a little bit. We were at this stage here, right? We talked about resonating elements a lot. We talked about clocks a lot. And then we talked about how to distribute clock signals inside our microcontrollers, like using these big MUXs and all the clocking system that's in your Smart Fusion. The thing that I kind of just brushed over was this part. I talked a little bit about software, but I didn't really talk much about hardware counters and how they really work in detail. So what I want to do quickly now is actually go into the blackboard and do a couple of exercises and actually design with you a timer to see how a timer could work and how they actually work. Okay. So from last lecture, what do you remember about the timer? What is the key element that you have in a timer? An oscillator. What? An oscillator, yes, but then what else is there? A counter, right? So you have a counting register that has an input signal into a clock input. Right? This is your clock. This comes from the resonating element with its driver and whatever is out there. Goes into a counter <coughs> that counts. Always one if there is a rising edge, usually. Now, you can usually configure this counter sometimes to count up or count down. Most of the time it's an up counter because you're interested in time going up, but sometimes you also want to count down. And other times you can actually configure them in mode where they count up and down. So they count all the way up to its highest number, and then they count down again from that higher number to zero instead of overflowing. So there's a lot of different ideas that you can do. What's the most important thing about your counter though? Yes, it usually has a certain number of bits, right? N bits. For example, in your Smart Fusion, you have a 32-bit counter that you can link up with a second one to make a 64-bit counter if you want to. So how does that work? How can you take two counters that are 32-bit and make them into a 64-bit counter? What do you need? Yes? Uh, just a connection from the last bit of the first to the first bit of the second. Basically an overflow signal, right? So there's a signal that pretty much every timer gives you when it overflows, when it goes from its highest number, so 2 to the power of n minus 1, back to 0. That's what's called an overflow. And what they do in the Smart Fusion is they take that overflow signal and basically hook it up as the clock input of your next counter. So the next counter just counts how often this counter overflowed and technically thus doubles your bit length. Right? Okay. Now last time, if you remember, we had two different functionalities that a timer usually offers. Do you remember what this was? Sorry? Set and reset, yes. That's more a software interface. But yeah? Capture yes, capture and compare. So what is the capture? What is a compare? Let's first do the capture, because that one is slightly more intuitive. So a capture is another register that sits up here that has a wide bus interface into this timer. And what happens is that when there is a signal from the external side coming in. When this signal comes in and has a rising edge, or you can configure it to all sometimes be a falling edge, let's take it a rising edge. When this signal rises, it will take the value that's stored in here and copy it over into your capture register. Right? So now it's saved. So this 
counter will keep incrementing as that one clocks in, but it will save the value in here that was written in your counter when this signal came. Okay, what? Who has done digital logic stuff? Almost everybody, right? I think there was a prerequisite, if I'm not mistaken. What can be dangerous about this? They could be out of sync, right? If by mischance this clock here comes in, well, this counter here is still incrementing, right? If you remember, if you ever designed a counter, a counter is not instantaneous. If you looked at the model sim system of your counter, you see that the bits change at different intervals of time. So if this thing here comes in, while this is just incrementing, then your capture value will be garbage. Right? So oftentimes your captures have actually logic in them to synchronize to this clock up here. So what we will do is there will be some logic in here that will make sure that you capture an actual value, not while it actually is incrementing. Oftentimes it's called a synchronization block. And there are lots of different techniques of dealing with this meta instability that it does not happen. Any questions to that? Okay. What's the problem with these things then? Assume you have a block here that makes sure that this will never be meta stable. What could be the problem? Multiple samples? Mm -hmm. Not really, no. Yeah? So when you said, sorry, I actually asked a question earlier, but mm -hmm. when you said that it could be transitioning right when you capture a new value, or you yes. said new value is being stored in your capture register, or your and your block will just count over your new value? No, what will happen is that this value here will be something in between while it was incrementing. Right. So incrementing doesn't mean that what is on here is just one too low or one too high, right? Because the increment is actually flipping a lot of different bits occasionally for incrementing just by one. So if you capture it in that instability, you will actually capture garbage in here. That will just be this value at that instant in time where this was still flipping around. You're saying the capture will capture? The capture will capture what's in here right at this time. And that does not mean that it was the one before or the one after. But you can deal with that with logic that comes in front, making sure that the capture can only capture this value when it is stable, right? But there's a problem with this logic. What can happen is that sometimes it can add a delay into your captures. So that, assume this happened at the time when this was metastable, but then your block delays it until you are in plus one. Or sometimes they have to actually do it already locked before this one here starts incrementing just to make sure that you don't hit that particular time. So it can be that your capture is actually plus one or plus two later than the actual signal <coughs> came in. How to figure out what happens is you have to go and read the documentation of your timer units to make sure that what you actually have there is understood in your software and you can take care of it. Oftentimes it doesn't really matter that much, but sometimes you, if you really want to have this specific time of something, these kind of things can be very important. So now what can you do with such a capture? What could this be used for? Doesn't yeah? Our, doesn't our computer have like a current time since current number of milliseconds? Like Unix time? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. right. that, that would be, that Similar, yeah. But there you don't have really a capture. All you do is you go and read a counter. In a computer, it's actually, the Unix time is implemented differently. It's, it's probably not a, a specific hardware counter in that particular case. But yes, you could start counting from a certain specific time point, but then you don't use the capture. What do you use a capture for? You are auto bit rate detection. You are auto bit rate detection. Okay, that comes later on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so you can detect a certain signal, right? Like it, you can use this now to measure time of a certain event, or more specifically, you can measure the time between two different events, right? Assume you have a wheel that turns, and every time it comes back to the top, it will give you a signal like this, right? So now, using your counter, you capture 
twice the time it took, so the first time when you're at the top, and then again when you're at the top. So now you have two times, you subtract one from the other, and then you know how many counter clock ticks you had between the wheel going once around. Right? So now you have counting clock ticks. Let's say you had 257 ticks. How can you now relate that back to time, to actual physical time? You use your clock frequency, exactly. That way you can now figure out how long it took in real time for the wheel to spin around. So that's what captures are used for. Okay? The second thing was a compare. What's a compare? Well, it's just yet another register. That's in here. And this time, instead of being filled from your counter, you fill this register with a time. Right? And then what the hardware does is it compares the value in here with the value of your counter. And once they match, it will do something on the output. For example, what it could do is it could interrupt you and generate an interrupt. Or oftentimes, they're linked up to a GPIO. And then there's a lot of different options that you can do, but oftentimes what it will do is it will toggle a GPIO pin. So when it was 1, it will set it to 0. When it was 0, it will set it to 1. Whenever this and this matches. And there are lots of different options there. Sometimes you can have a set only, sometimes you have a reset only, or a set reset, reset set, etc., etc. Yet again, can be a very complicated thing, but the principle of a compare is always the same. It's a value that you write in software into that register, and whenever that register matches with a counter, something will happen. An action will be taken. So what could you use a compare for? Loop counters? Yes? Pulse width modulation? Scheduling an event, exactly, right? Scheduling an event, it would generate an interrupt, interrupt your software, and you can do something at that particular time. PWMs are very important utilities. Oftentimes there, you actually use two compare registers. So you need basically two compares saying that one of them will be the period of your signal, the other one will be the duty cycle of your PWM signal. So oftentimes what happens is that you have one compare that when this guy here reaches the first compare, it will go back to zero. Instead of having to overflow, it will always count to what this compare is set to. That will give you your period. And then you have a second compare, which will be in between zero and what this value is, which will give you the duty cycle. And then whenever the counter reaches that second compare, it will toggle a bit too high. Did that make sense? So, for example, in the MSP430, what you will have is the period will be the register CCR0, and the width will be CCR1, right? So assuming we have a 32 kilohertz clock, so clock is 32, 6, 8 kilohertz, How could we generate a duty cycle? No, how can we generate a period of half a second with a duty cycle, let's do, of 80%? Okay, so let's say period is 2 hertz and W 80%. Get together in teams of two, solve this quickly. I want two numbers. What would you write into CCR0 for the period? And what would you write in CCR1 for the duty cycle? It's two numbers. So how many clock ticks do you have to take to get to 2 hertz? Sorry? 16K. 16K? Yes? Which, what is it exactly? 16 to 14. 32 to 14, right? 
If you notice, this is 2 to the 15. Right? So to get to 2 hertz, it's just 2 to the 14 counts. It'll be half of this one here. So you have 32.768 clock ticks per second. So you have, when your counter reaches to the 14, half of it, you will be at your period. So what you do is you write into your CCR0, 2 to the 14, so that your counter will start at 0, count up to 2 to the 14, and then keep counting at 0 again. Right? So it will do something like this. This is time. This is count. It will count up to the value stored in CCR0. <coughs> And then it will go down and start again. Go down, start again. Okay. While the time from here to here is 0 0.5 seconds. Sorry, this is a little tiny. Running out of space. Okay. So now how can you generate a signal that has 80% as its duty set? Sorry? Just take whatever is 80% of this in CCR0. Right. So 0 0.8 times 2 to the 14. Can somebody calculate that? 13,107. 13,107.2. 13, yeah. Oops. That's a problem. Right? What do we do with this point 0.2? Rounded, yes. So we are not exactly at 80%, but we are really close by. Right? So if you write this now in CCR1, what will happen is when the count reaches that particular value here, it will flip the GPIO. When it reaches this one here and resets, it will set it back to zero. It will keep counting back up. To 80%, it will flip it again, high, gets low again, gets high again, gets low again. And now it's really easy to change your duty cycle on this particular signal because all you do is you rewrite this particular register to a new number, and that way you can change the duty cycle from 0 to 100%, depending on what you need. Any questions? No? Yes? Yes, so CCR1 would flip the bit from 0 to 1, and then when you hit CCR0, it would flip it from 1 to 0. And how this all is implemented in, in the timers always depends on your manufacturer. So this is CCR1 and CCR0 is actually from the nomenclature that the MSP430s timers use. And the Smart Fusion's timers cannot generate PWM signals because there's no GPIO signal or GPIO unit that's connected to them. So they can't flip external pins, actually. They have PWM units themselves directly, which work very similar. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, in Lab 5, you actually will implement uh, your own PWM. Like, you implement your own, ti your own timer and have to flip a bit accordingly to what you do in it to generate a PWM signal. Okay, then let's go to the next topic. So right now, assume you have five compare registers. The compare register, as you remember, is a value that you can write into the timer, and then you will generate you an interrupt, and it will wake you up so you can do a certain task. Now, you have five of these registers. What happens if you have six events that you have to schedule? How could you deal with that? You basically have to virtualize your timer, right? You somehow have to juggle and figure out, okay, event number six will be the event that comes the last, so I first handle my first one, and once that's handled, I will write event number six into that particular compare register. That way you could do it. So you have to have some sort of a linked list or a list that you keep in software that has a list between which event happens at what particular time. 
And this list has to be somewhat ordered in software. So that's exactly what virtual timers are. Virtual timers in software is a software implementation of your compare registers that needs only one compare register to have a potentially infinite amount of schedulable events that you can have. So how do they work? The simple idea is, let's say we have 10 events that we want to generate. So we make a linked list of these events. Every element in the linked list is ordered by time of their occurrence. And every event has a function handler that should be called at a certain particular time. Right? So what we do is, we then in our timer take the first element out of the list, schedule a compare event for that event. When that event happens, we remove it from the list, look at the next event, schedule that one, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where you go through the list. Now, if somebody wants to add something into the list, they have to order it into that linked list, right? It has to go into the right time of the list so that you can actually schedule it later on. What are some of the problems? Well, it only works for compare timer use. Captures are really difficult to virtualize, but at least you can now schedule your events that way, as many as you want. Another problem is the interrupt service routine now will become slower. Because all of a sudden your ISR happens and then you have to go in software through a linked list finding which element you have to deal with. That takes time and it's not instantaneous anymore. What else could happen during implementation? Well, you all of a sudden have a linked list that you have to share between your interrupt service routines and software code. Right? When software tries to schedule something, it will have to add an element into the linked list. But as you remember from the interrupt lecture, what happens if an interrupt happens while you're adding something into the linked list? So you have to be very careful and use and disable interrupts while mod modifying these shared variables and these shared components. Same with deletion, right? Deletion happens inside the ser interrupt service routine. So if you try to add something and then he comes and deletes something out of it, you can get big mumble jumble with sharing these two elements. Another problem, how do we deal with a modulo counter? Right? This particular counter that we had here, assume it's 16-bit, so we can count up to two seconds. What if your event is five minutes from now? How do you schedule that? Any ideas? Yes. Software bits. Remember, your timer will probably tell you when it overflows. Right? We'll generate an interrupt when it overflows. So you could just read that interrupt and then have a software bit counter that just counts how often did we overflow. And that way, you can actually extend your timers in software fairly easily. What else would be nice? Well, it would be nice if instead of just an event that happens once, we could tell, okay, this event should happen every 10 seconds. So that's another one of these features you can fairly easily implement in virtual timers by just having a, a mode together with in your um, linked list that will tell, well, schedule this event again in 10 seconds from when it happened last time. A one-shot event would be, well, you don't need to reschedule that when it happened now, but it, you could have very easily reoccurring events that way. That's actually a big issue. What happens if two events should happen at the exact same time in your software. Well, you now have to decide which one of them you want to do first and which one do second. Depending on these events, if they take a long time, it could be that your events now get out of sync and that could become a problem. <laughs> so virtual timers are really nice because oftentimes you don't have limits in how many events you can actually schedule in them. At the same time, they're not as precise anymore as a compare register itself. So oftentimes good for stuff that has soft delays and soft latencies. If you have to have something that's at a very precise time, it's really difficult to do in a software virtualized system. <clears throat> data structure can be a little bit of an issue. You have to think about how to implement such a data structure. And yes, you will implement one of them in lab five for your timers. You actually will write a virtualized, uh, you will virtualize your timer itself. 
And this is a suggestion that you will get for this implementation. So what we have is a timer handler. So you have a function that has to, um, has to be a timer handler itself. You initialize a function that initializes, of course, your hardware timer. You have a function that's called start timer one shot. And when you call this function, what happens is you give it a handler and a time when this handler should be called. You can do the similar thing with a start timer continuous where you have a handler and a delta t. So now this timer will be called every delta t times. And you probably also want a function that's a stop timer where if you have a continuous timer that counts all the time, you want to give it this particular handler and it should remove it from the linked list so you can actually stop this particular timer to not reoccur again. So more implementation, is, is, um, implementation details, what you have to do is the initialization, of course you set up the hardware, you initialize the linked list, and you set the current timer to null because right now in the beginning initialization there is no timers. This data structure for one of the nodes can be something like this where you have a handler, you have a time associated with it, a certain mode, and a link to the next timer. That would have happen. So now implementing these functions will be your job. Start timer one shot adds the handler into the linked list at the right time. So you have to traverse your linked list, find the right time where you have to add it in there. Start timer one continuous, you have to add it again correctly into your linked list. And if you stop the timer, you have to traverse your linked list and actually remove that particular element out of your linked list. In your interrupt service routine, something like this has to happen where you have first clear the interrupt and the pending bit, then you set timer to the current timer. So that's the timer that has to be expired right now. You look if this timer is a continuous mode. If it is, you re-add it back into your list, um, ordered of course. And then you go and treat the different interrupts down here with the right flags that you have to do. Yes? Is this kind of like a priority? Kind of. Or are we doing to worry about You could add a priority bit into it, yes. Where you say like if you have somebody else that comes at the exact same time, you can give them different priorities. You could totally do that. Okay. No, not directly. No. I don't think so. Okay. Any questions to timers? Yes, before we wrap this up. Each struct adds an interrupt, right? No, there is only one interrupt that will happen all the time, right? Your interrupt is this interrupt service routine. That's your timer that will basically tell you, hey, we had a compare right now. And whenever this compare happened, you know that the top element in your linked list was the one that caused this element. So you will execute that particular event, remove it from the linked list, look at the next element, and set up your timer for that next element to happen. Any other questions? Was timers okay? Clear, mostly? Because software-wise, you will see it in lab five, um, you will implement a timer and actually use it in software a lot. So it will probably give you a lot more information on how timers work and in software itself. Okay, memory landscape. We saw this picture before, right, where we had different interfaces. And what we talked about was this particular bus interface here on the right-hand side. We talked about bus transactions, just a little reminder of them. We have read and write transactions. These devices will tell us how to use a particular memory chip. We talked about interfacing itself. We had address bits, we had data bits, chip enable bits, etc., etc. So now comes the big question. Well, what's inside this memory array here? Right? Okay, we know how we have addresses, we have data that we talk to, we have to twiddle a couple of bits properly so that data either comes out or gets put back into the memory. Now the big question is, what's in this particular memory? Because there are several different categories. The first one, read-only memory, or ROM, usually only able to read this memory. You cannot write back into it. The other one is a random access memory, or RAM. Now, technically, this is a historic term. ROM these days is also random access memory, but RAM is usually considered to be read and writable. And that's the two different categories, ROMs and RAMs. Now, we can have 
volatile memory. Volatile memory means that if you lose power, it's gone, it's volatile. Or non-volatile memory, where if power is gone, the memory actually stays and keeps its content. So next time you power on, you can actually read it back out again. So if you look at this in a little diagram, what we can have is RAM can be volatile or non-volatile. We have the different types of static RAM and dynamic RAM, which we'll look at. Non-volatile memory, EPROMs, flash memory, FRAM, MRAM, and DDS RAM. While as ROMs, well, there is no volatile ROM, usually. It's always non-volatile. And what we have is like mask ROMs, PROMs, or EPROMs. So how do you choose a memory for your different applications? Well, there are a lot of different objectives that you have to look at. Of course, volatility. Do you need the data when power is gone or not? Cost, how expensive is it? Organization, is it a 64K by one bit, or is it an 8K by eight bit, or other architectures that can be there? Yes? Is that in reference to alignment? We will look into it. It's in how the architecture of your memory block is. Interface, is it serial, parallel, synchronous, or asynchronous? Access times, how fast is the memory that you need? That will oftentimes be determined by your application. If you have a high-speed video application that you have to write into memory somewhere, you have to make sure your memory is actually fast enough. Modify times, so sometimes the read times and modify times are different. Erase process, if you need to erase your data, how do you erase it? Is it a block erase? Or do you have to expose it to UV light for five minutes? Um, granularity, do you erase a page, a word, a bit, or the whole chip, as in with the UV light? And the architectures can really vary quite a bit. However, most of the times, this is the very general architecture. That's why before you just saw a little block of memory array. What you have is you have a certain amount of word lines, you have memory cells in there, and then you have bit lines that come up. So whenever you select a certain verb line, the bit lines will be set accordingly to what's stored <coughs> in these particular memory cells. So the question now becomes, what should be the aspect ratio? Right? How many word lines do you have? How many bit lines do you have down here? The question also becomes now interesting because these memory cells are not zero size. So if you actually look at them, they have a certain size, and that particular size of these memory cells is first of all defined by the technology that's used to pro manufacture them. That's what we see here. So the technology over time, you're going down, 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 down in size, right, in our lambda, and that will actually define the physical size of our um, possible transistors that we can put into our memory cells. Over time, we were be making better and better progress. So here, for example, for flash, NORAM, and FERAM. FERAM was fairly big, but it's coming down, down, down. And this is from 2004. So today, we actually have solutions to make them down here. We found solutions how to do it. And now you can see the difference. FERAM is a lot bigger than flash NORAM in physical size. So what could be some of the implications about that? What if the cell size is, for example, let's take this example here where we have about 0.1 micrometer squared versus about 5 micrometers squared. What's the implications of that? Longer distance, less memory density, right? If your memory cell is, what, about 5 times bigger, then you can have less memory on the same chip area. So if you have less memory on the same chip area, what does that mean? Hmm? Overall less memory and more expensive for the same amount of memory, right? Because now all of a sudden, if you want one megabit of FE RAM, the chip is a lot bigger, it's a lot more silicon, so the process becomes more expensive to actually make this particular memory. Does yeah. that take more power to actually hold the larger chip? Probably also more power, yes. Not necessarily, but it can be more power, yes. Okay, so let's look at physical on-chip memory configurations. Physical on-chip memory is typically square because that has the best performance with um, aspect ratio. It, it minimizes the length of word line and bit lines and thus becomes more efficient inside of your chips. The shorter length means that we have shorter propagation times 
through the chips, right? The longer the wire is, the longer it takes to go through it, the faster the data access becomes and the smaller the read cycle time. Now, let's do a little exercise. Let's assume we have a square, n-square memory cell configuration, okay? How big is an n by n-square array? If we assume we take one megabit of data, and let's you say that we have a 10 micron per cell width. How big will this square be if it's an n by n, or if it's an n squared by one, right? So one of them would be One of them is a one megabit, so it's a thousand this time, a thousand that time, right? <clears throat> n by n. And the other one would be really long, one by a million. Let's assume each cell is 10 micro. How big is this chip? inch? How did you get from millimeters to inches? Okay. <laughs> what is it? Each cell is 10 micrometers. Yes. How much this would be? 10,000 micrometers, right? How much is that? That's 10, 10 millimeters? Yes. So 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters. What about this guy here? How long would be an array of a million cells at 10 micrometers? Yes? 10 meters. Clearly this is not a chip you want to have in your embedded system, right? Okay, what's the transition time through this chip? Assume the speed of light on a chip is about 2 thirds C. How long does it take to access the worst case in this chip and the worst case in this chip. So trying to access this last bit here, how long does it take? The last one, that's the worst case. Because in this guy here, you have to traverse 10 meters of chip to get to that last bit there. How long does it take for to get 10 meters at two thirds the speed of light? Sounds about right. Like something in the net few nanoseconds of time. So okay, let's put two and two together. Up there, I say shorter length means shorter propagation time. He just calculated for a chip that's 10 meters long, the propagation time to just get to that bit would be in a few nanoseconds. Okay, 50 nan? No, it should be less. It is 50 nanoseconds? Okay, yes. Sounds about right. So if you remember, when we did this exercise on the access speed of this memory cell that we had, how much was the fastest one to guarantee our access? 90 nanoseconds, right, was the access time. Remember the 90 nanoseconds one that we had, that exercise we did? So okay, when, if it takes 50 nanoseconds to get to a bit at 10 meters, Right? It takes almost no time in an actual squared, or even if this would be a little bit a skewed kind of architecture. So no propagation delay is not the big latency that you will have to deal with. So what else could it be? What else is there that we have to worry about? So it's not just the time it takes for a signal to go through your chip. Yeah. 
Yeah. There's some logic in there. So there's some logic to select the different lines in here <laughs> that will add delays in there. But also accessing your memory bit itself, right? Depending on what the technology of that particular bit is, it might take some time to tell you if it's a one or if it's a zero. That won't be an instantaneous answer out of it. So know that the propagation delay itself doesn't have much to do with the area or how the behavior of it is. It's more about the surrounding logic and the particular technology that you have in your memory cells that will determine the access time and the speed at which you can actually read that memory chip out. Okay, external memories. Well, external memories are most of the time tall and narrow. So internal, we have squared because it makes it more convenient for our chips themselves. If we have them external, we actually have them in a different architecture, tall and narrow. And the reason of this is because we can then change the amount of pins it needs to access this particular chip. Remember, we only have a limited amount of, of, of pins and I.O. interfaces that we can interface with. So we want to reduce that particular amount. So let's assume we have a, 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 tall, a tall and narrow configuration. And let's say we have a 64 kilobit interface. So the 64K can have a lot of different architectures internally. It could be a 64K by one, right? So we would have 16 addresses and one data bit. That would be only 17 pins. That would be really nice, right? You can access 64K of data with just 17 pins. We can also do a 32 by 2. So now you have 15 addresses and two data lines. Also pretty good still. All right, let's go to 16 by 4. So now you have 16K, 4 bit addresses, 18 pins. All of a sudden we have 4 bits that we get out at once, but we need now 18 pins to interface to it becomes worse and worse. 8K by 8, all of a sudden we need 21 pins. Or if we go to a 4K by 16, we now all of a sudden have 28 pins. Or if you go one further, if you want to actually a full 32-bit data interface, a 2K by 32K, we all of a sudden need 34 pins. So basically, if you think about it, every address bit that you add can double the amount of memory that you can address. Right? Well, with the database, you can't do that. So that's why you want a tall and narrow interface, like a 64K by 1. Well, you probably don't want a 64K by 1 because a 1 bit interface would be very painful to read out. But you probably want to go something with like an 8 or a 16 bit data interface. Because else it just becomes untractable with the amount of data pins that you will need on your microcontroller to interface with these chips. Any questions? Yes? Serial communication? There you are, of course, on your own. Like, so basically what happens is that the controller now inside the chip will do the whole decoding and encoding. You will have a lot fewer pins, of course, to use, sometimes as few as two pins that you only need, like for an I2C, for example. At the same time, it's a lot slower than one of these configurations, right? Because here, for example, with a configuration of 8K by 8, with one read you get 8 data bits out. With a serial communication you have to serialize the whole interface. It will be a lot slower than what you can do with these parallel interfaces. Okay, let's look at a couple of internals. Uh, we have seen this before where you have the address bits, we have a decoder and a muxer down here. We have the logic of output enable, chip select and write enable. And you have some input and output buffers that can push out the data bit or actually read the data bit back in. Quick exercise for you guys. Assume right here we have now a four by four interface, right? So we have four word lines and we have four data lines that get mucks down. What happens if we go from a four by four array to a 16 by 16, a 16 by one array? How would the interface change? What would the decoder look like? What would your demuxer look like? We only want one data bit out. What would this guy do here? Four in? Zero in? 
So 16 by 4 is a 16, uh, 16 by 1 would be 16 word lines, one data line. Is it? It's a good question. Is it x, y, or is it y, x? Years, okay. Guess, well, in that case, okay, then let's do a one in sixteen out. <laughs> no, you don't need more data lines. You just have a mux down here. So, how would this mux look like? Sixteen. Exactly. So this would be. One tall, 16 long, you have 16 outputs, and down here you had, have a 16 to 1 mux that would select the bit out of this particular memory array. The other way around, the 16 to 1 would be on this side here, and you would select which particular word line would get selected that would throw out the particular bit down here. And let's actually talk about non-volatile memories. Non the easiest non-volatile memory is MassGrum. MassGrum is very expensive to manufacture the very first time because what you basically have to do is you have to manufacture a mask with which you will make a physical chip. But once you have this mask, that's usually a, a, a manufacturing cost of about $200,000, the silicon you use later on is a lot cheaper. So once you have the mask, making the chips themselves is really cheap. So if you have to make a lot of them, Maskrom is what you want to go with. How does it work? Well, it physically burns and makes the connections in your silicon, and they will not be able to change later on. So in this particular case, this will give you an example where they use diodes to connect word lines to data lines. In this case, we have an 8 by um, a, so you said 3 by 8? Would this be that? Is that right? You know, what did you say? Rows before columns? Rows by columns. Okay, so it would be a 3 by 8. And what happens is that you have three data bits input, which will select one of the data, one of the word lines, and then you get a result down here on the bit lines. So what's the output for a data 101? That 101. One. <coughs> This one here? So we have a connection, connection, connection. Can somebody read this diagram and tell me what the output would be? One, one, one? Why? It's correct. Correct. So the diode basically connects here, right? So if this word, uh, this word line is high, so this connects here, so this will be high, this will be high, this will be high, so we get a one, one, one. So let's take one, one, zero. It would be word line number six. So this is connected. Again, this is a one. This is a one. So what happens to this line here? It's not connected. connected. Why is it a zero, though? Pull down resistor, exactly. Now here we have a resistor, so that will pull this line down to zero, so we have a one, zero, one. Mass graph, fairly simple to do. Next, EEPROM. These are um, erasable, programmable, read-only memories. So these are memories that you cannot write back into, but you can erase them. And you can erase them by exposing them to UV light. If you have ever taken apart an old computer, you have seen probably some chips in them that had like a little sticker on top of each of them. And if you took the sticker out, what you saw is something like this. You had like a glass and an exposed chip underneath it. That's an EEPROM. How you delete them is you take that sticker away, put them into a machine like this down here, and you erase them by exposing it to UV light for five minutes, and then they are all erased. And in this particular case, erasing means you write ones into each and every location. And programming them means that you write some of them back to zero. Once you have done that, you cannot change this data again unless you re-erase the whole chip 
by exposing it to UV light. EEPROMs are rarely seen anymore and because they're expensive to manufacture because this chip has to have a quartz um, on top of it so it's possible to expose it to UV light um, but that's very expensive to make and so we basically don't see them anymore. What's used these days is mostly flash memory, right? Probably pretty much everyone is running around with a, a USB stick in their pockets. That's flash memory. So how does flash memory work? It's electrically erasable memory. So you can erase it with an electric write into them. The erase size is a block. So it's actually not a word. So you cannot erase byte by byte or 16 bit by order 32 bit. It's usually a whole block that you have to erase at once. Erase circuitry, instead of having it inside the memory cell, it's pulled out into the logic. And that's why you can only erase a whole block um, at once. But by doing this, you take the logic and instead of having it duplicated in each and every memory cell, you have it outside, it makes the whole chip cheaper. That's why flash memory these days is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper um, to manufacture. You can write bits into memory cells. So once you erase a block, that actually makes it from zero to ones. You can erase parts of it or write into it by writing some of these bits to zero. Once you have the data written into it, if you want to erase it, you have to erase the whole block before you can actually start writing over it again. The technology is what's called a floating gate technology. And unfortunately, you can only have about 10 to 100K of erases. So flash memory is not a very good memory if you have to use it to write and read from it all the time. So if you have USB sticks, better make backups because they're prone to break eventually. Especially if you run, for example, Libero on top of it or use it as a live file system to um, read and write from it all the time. And they do break eventually. And once they're broken, well, your data is gone if you don't have a backup. Any questions to non-volatile memory? No? Okay, <clears throat> then let's talk about volatile memory. What's volatile memory? Well. Pretty much all your RAM that you have in your computers is what's called volatile memory. There are two main um, technologies. One of them is static RAM. The other one is dynamic RAM. This is a static RAM technology. Static means that once you write into it, as long as you keep power on it, <coughs> the data will stay in there. You don't have to do anything with it. There are two different things that you can do with them. One of them would be a 4T configuration. The other one is 6T configuration. This back here is the, the 6T configuration where you have access lines on the left and right and you configure the most the, the PFETs um, in, the, in the configuration in there such that when you write something in it and you let go, this is a stable system. It either will output a 1 or a 0. It has extreme fast access times, so it's on the orders of nanoseconds. But because you need six transistors to make them, its physical size is fairly large compared to what's called dynamic RAM or DRAM. <coughs> DRAM has one transistor and one capacitor. So what happens is to write into it, you either charge the capacitor to represent a one or you discharge the capacitor to represent a zero. Now, what's the problem with a capacitor? They leak, they discharge themselves. So what you have to do with DRAM is you have to occasionally refresh the status on it if you don't use memory cells. So you have a refresh cycle. In addition to that, what happens if you read the capacitor out? You erase it. You erase it. So once you read a DRAM memory cell, you actually have to write it back if you want to keep the data in there. So access time is not as fast as static memory. At the same time, because we only have a capacitor and a FET, the size is very small, so you can make a lot of them inside of a very small area of die. So it's a lot cheaper, but it costs more in order to use it later on with keeping refreshing it or reading and writing out of it. 